Come along with me to the highest heights of the Academy. We're here to bury forever a right-wing fantasy. Campus free speech. Campus free speech. Free speech on college campuses. This is now a crisis. In the there is no free speech crisis on college campuses. That's a delusion, an addicting fiction sold to gullible cable news audiences. Crisis requires conflict. Crisis requires warring parties. And on campus, the war is over. We're visiting three schools with three professors who dared to dissent. Come see what happened to them. Come see what the winners can get away with now that the crisis is over. July 2020, the summer of our national racial reckoning. A group of Princeton professors draws up an open letter proposing a vast array of reforms to combat the school's systemic racism. They demand mandatory campus-wide anti-racism training, explicitly asking that all right-wing students attend. They demand an end to standardized testing. And they demand that black faculty receive extra salary for their invisible work. Hundreds of Princeton professors co-sign the letter. I think a number of people signed the thing because they felt this was the politically correct thing to do. You know, it's a popularity contest. It's not unlike what you see, for instance, in high schools, right? You want to be with the, with the cool crowd. Two dozen undergraduates sign an open letter of their own in which they strenuously oppose anti-racism training, calling it a wrong think correctional program. One of those undergrads is Abigail Anthony. Within a few days, we were being called uh, Nazi collaborators, fascists, white supremacists. We were being attacked constantly. One undergraduate student who held a position in our undergraduate student government cropped the letter to show just the signatories and she sent it on a dormitory listserv to a couple hundred students and she said, oh, I'm posting the name of signatories so we know who the racists on campus are. There's only one professor in the entirety of Princeton that's willing to publicly criticize that set of obscene anti-racism demands. A, a lonely voice that kind of emerges from the musky halls of the classics department. This is Joshua Katz. He taught at Princeton for over 25 years. So Joshua Katz and I actually go way back. He was my professor at Princeton um, and I loved his class. Um, we were friendly. In 2020, I just shot him an email saying, hey, have you seen this? What, did, what do you think about it? And he wrote me back and said, I've actually got a piece coming out about it tomorrow and I'm about to be canceled hard. He writes an essay in the online journal Quillette warning that the letter's demands would lead to a civil war on campus. And he also specifically calls out the Black Justice League, an old student activist group. How do we convince people that our lives matter? When one Black undergraduate publicly criticized the group, its members flooded her social media with Aunt Jemima's and told her, we're going to make sure you don't get a job after graduation. Katz accurately describes BJL as a small local terrorist organization that made life miserable for many including many black students. Katz is instantly unpersoned. 99 plus percent of people I would have called my friends stopped speaking to me overnight. The university said that they would investigate the matter, which is bizarre. Then the idea of an investigation was squashed. That was a huge relief for many people, I think. And we thought that was the end of the matter. What, so that's it? 
it's not it, no. A complicated contraption of cancellation is set in motion, and it starts with a tragic undergraduate love affair. In 2006, Katz is unmarried, and he starts sleeping with an undergraduate. Their relationship lasts a couple semesters. She graduates, but they never physically see each other again. A long time ago, I did have a fully consensual relationship with a senior undergraduate. Um, that was a mistake. That was a sin. They do, however, email each other incessantly. We got their emails. Years after she's graduated, she's messaging him, if you die, I would definitely kill myself. Over a decade after she's graduated, she's married with children, and she's still emailing him. I love you more than any person I've ever met. I would have done anything to make you happy. In 2017, someone tips off the administration. Princeton launches a formal investigation, and that same scorned undergraduate lover refuses to cooperate. And she's instead, she's texting him legal advice. Try to provide as little information in your response as possible. Remember, this is one-off, not a pattern of behavior. Katz is convicted and suspended for one year. That suspension is kept a secret. Huh. The university disguises it as an extra year of sabbatical. Who tipped off the administration to start that initial investigation? And I have been told that the person who likely did it was Katz's former apprentice, a guy by the name of Daniel Peralta. Peralta was born in the Dominican Republic, and he eventually earns a spot as an undergraduate at Princeton, where he falls under the tutelage of a world-renowned classic scholar by the name of Joshua Katz. I became friendly with one of my classics professors, Joshua Katz. Danielle was one of the most remarkable undergraduates I have ever seen. He was an extraordinary undergraduate in, in every possible respect. Katz helps Peralta get a job as a classics professor at Princeton. Well, what does he do next? He turns traitorous. Hmm. Danelle denounces classics as racist. He snags a glamorous spread in the New York Times and promises to save the profession from whiteness. We can't say definitively why Peralta decided to take out Katz in 2017, why he went full Anakin Skywalker, but we do know the following. Danell is one of the people that organized that 2020 open letter denouncing Princeton's systemic racism. We know that immediately after Katz published his critique, Princeton's undergraduate newspaper launched an investigation and it eventually published a front page story detailing Katz's history of inappropriate conduct. It notes his alleged relationship with an undergraduate and a highly unusual extra sabbatical. We don't know who leaked the information to the Daily Princetonian. We, we do know that the Daily Princetonian came into possession of information that it ultimately used to publish a hit piece about Joshua. Peralta also dated that same scorned lover of Joshua Katz. So he knows Katz's secret. The piece thanks two unnamed professors for their help. And we know that the thesis advisor for one of the student journalists was Danelle Peralta. The resulting firestorm causes the administration to reopen the case. But this time around, that undergraduate flips and she cooperates with the investigators. Since the first investigation, Katz had announced he was getting married. All these years later, the pain of a failed undergraduate romance burns deep, and she turns over thousands of pages of emails, which the administration uses to mount a new case. The investigator knocks Katz for saying the relationship started in September, when it really started in June. And in one single text, he tried to talk the student out of seeing a therapist. 
But that's all the details Princeton needs to find him guilty of procedural misconduct and to fully fire him. There is a silent minority that thinks that what happened to his career in terms of him just being fired from university is super suspect. But they don't say anything. Yeah. Say nothing. Yes. And again, why is that? So They're all scared. I think the university could do anything almost. I mean, they, they could do almost anything and the faculty will not react. And the students will also not react. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, unfortunately, I must say, I'm of the opinion now that nothing would happen. They could do it. The university could do it and not much will happen. The firing of Joshua Katz is not the last abuse that we will see at the university.